it was one of those 9-11 moments. Everybody can tell you what they were and what they were doing because the world stopped. You know, the people won't ever forget this. They scarred a whole community and a lot of youth had things changed for them at a young age that doesn't normally happen, you know. He had to be somewhat uh, kind of mentally disturbed to, to do what he did. He didn't take into account what his actions would do to not just a family at that moment, but to a community for a lifetime. She would always go pick up frogs and snakes. She wasn't afraid of them. She'd go chase those and then go try to give them to me. And I wasn't a big fan of frogs and snakes, you know, when I was two. But that's what I'll always remember her doing is being the girl that used to snatch those up. I remember that it had rained earlier that day. I had found a little painted turtle when I had picked it up and I put it in the back of my truck thinking that, you know, later in the day I was going to give it to Tara for a pet. This was a five-year-old white girl that was last seen alive at 1.30 on May 21st of 1981. She had been at the kindergarten during the morning and ate a meal with, with milk, cookies, hot dogs, and Pepsis. Approximately 1.30 in the afternoon, I'd come back home to give her the turtle, and she still wasn't there. Roughly about 5 p.m., she was reported missing uh, to the police. As a kid, you just thought, well, they're gonna, they're gonna find her and everything's gonna be fine because it's quiet here. Nothing bad ever happens here. You know, there was literally 100 people walking the neighborhood looking for her and nobody, you know, could find her. Nobody could answer any questions. And we thought that, okay, it's a little girl. She, you know, she's sleeping in someone's backyard. She's at a friend's house, whatever. I had noticed this young boy sitting on the porch and he was looking at me and he just had this, you know, just an odd expression on his face. And I can remember thinking to myself, you know, who is that kid? You know, why is he looking at me like this, you know? Uh, after extensive amount of searching, uh, the body was found not too far from the house. In a pit, uh, the boy that found the body pulled the body out of the pit and laid it in the nearby grass before calling for help. My mother happened to be there, and she had fainted when he said that. And, uh, you know, my father was at home. He had been injured at work. He couldn't participate in the search. So he stayed home to answer the phone. And so I went home and let my father know, you know, they found her, and she was dead. Didn't know a 13-year-old could do something to what he did. His, what his level of uh, ability to do something like this was just outrageous. Uh, to, to, you know, uh, that picture alone strikes out a pause. Of here's a 13-year-old, and his life is basically, I mean, shot. Nobody knew. Nobody had any idea he was out. You kind of think, oh yeah, they have a big hearing, you get to go testify as to why you don't feel that he should be let out of prison. And How do you get paroled in the state of Illinois and end up in Florida? So he ends up in Florida, then comes back. We never knew he was in Florida or here. He only had multiple escape attempts. If they were letting him out on so-called good behavior, I don't see where that would be considered good behavior.
it um, was a typical day like any other day, and him and his brother asked if they could go down with the rest of the kids that always went down to the river after lunch. And I said, sure, and this was a little after one, and, and told him I need to be home by five. And then when five o'clock came, and Chris wasn't home, I was mad, I was frustrated, I was like, you know, is he supposed to be home on time? Why isn't he home? The boy was last seen riding a royal blue girl's bicycle and was wearing blue shorts with a volleyball emblem and a tie-dye green t-shirt with black and red tennis shoes. Uh, it was about the day after Christopher disappeared when there was a police composite in the newspaper. And instantly when I seen the picture, I, I knew it was Tim Buss. That was my feelings. Was... And my grandma and um, a couple of her kids went out to visit Micah out in Aroma Park. And Micah didn't understand why they were there. She, Micah didn't live here when, the, when it happened with Tara, so she wasn't familiar with the story. She was still in the Air Force. And she just didn't understand, why are these people here? Christopher's not, he's not dead, he's still alive. You know, once Timothy Buss's name was brought up, everybody knew, but, but Micah at that point, she had a lot of hope. And when everybody else heard that name, no one else did. My doorbell rang. And when I looked at the detective, I knew. And she came in and said a child's body had been found, but they couldn't identify that it was Chris. And I looked right at her and I said, but there's no other children missing. He was stabbed over 50 times. He had, he had defensive wounds on the, on the inside of his hands where you could see he tried to fight him off. And then he was mutilated as well. It wasn't the first or second or third or fourth or fifth stab wound. It took a lot of times before he died. And that is where, um, where I lost it. Today, about two and a half days before my term ends as governor, I stand before you to explain my frustrations and deep concerns about both the administration and the penalty of death. I'm commuting the sentence of all death row inmates, 167 of them. I'm not happy that he's alive. I wish he was dead. I wish I could do it. But at the same time, the state of Illinois had a problem, okay? When one out of every 10 people being put to death was found innocent later on, there was a problem. Though I figured, you know, this time justice will be served. He, he will never do this again. He doesn't have to pay rent. He doesn't have to worry about where his next meal comes from um, or whether the bills are going to get paid. Because I don't think he deserves a good day, a single good day in his life after what he did. Granted, he has to live in a prison, um, but the prison I've been living in and my family's been living in is a hell of a lot worse. As we were going through town, all the way from the west side of Kanki from Shreplers, all the way out to Roma Park, Cars were pulled over to the side of the road as we passed by. Construction workers stopped and took their hard hats off and put them over their heart. I mean, everybody knew it was his funeral. And this community, how it, it, it doesn't just affect the family, you know, it affects the community. I did take part in the candlelit vigil at the corner by the church and the school. It kind of brought it to light to me as a kid, that he wasn't just lost, like, oh, I got lost in the woods and someone's gonna come find me. 
it kind of brought it to light that he something was wrong, that it was worse than just being lost. Every morning, instead of just being a crossing guard, there was always a police officer there with the crossing guard, and our parents walked us to school, which never happened before. It really changed things after that. I mean, after the fact, I mean, you then you started noticing, you know, people didn't let their children out. I'm way overprotective of my two daughters because of what I experienced as a child, you know, because of this whole case. Well, you'll hear people say, oh, in time you'll, you'll get over it. But that's, that's people that's never had anything happen to them. It, this is not something that you get over.